Turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. We're going to read here the end of chapter 3, and then we're going to go straight into chapter 4. James chapter 3. Starting here with verse number 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. The wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing is seen. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Chapter 4, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Did they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. That you may spend it on your pleasures, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy who are you to judge another? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there by sale and make a profit. The title of this message is Changing Price Tags. Our Father in heaven, I pray for your anointing over this word. As we look at this passage from the book of James, I pray, Father, that your word will speak clearly to each and every one of us. I pray, Father, for revelation. I pray, Father, for inspiration. I pray, Father, for ready and eager ears to hear what your word is saying. Speak, Holy Spirit. Speak, Holy Spirit. It is your comfort. It is your teaching. It is you that we implore, Father. And we pray that you will indeed bless us and anoint the, the word as it goes forth to our ears. We pray for your Holy Spirit always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Changing price tags. Years ago, Tony Campolo wrote a book about Christianity. It was called, Who Switched the Price Tag? He told about the time he and his best friend decided to break into the basement of the local five and dime store. They didn't plan to rob the place. They were Sunday school boys, after all. Instead, they planned to do something that was far worse for the owner. Their plan was to break in, change the price tags on everything. I don't think they actually got beyond the planning stages. 
But they imagined customers arriving and discovered that radios were selling for a quarter and bobby pins were priced at $5 a piece. <laughs> Campola wrote, with diabolical glee, we wondered what it would be like when nobody could figure out what the prices of things really should be. You see, in a store, Price tags tells us the value of what we want to buy. But if someone switches the price tags, it's hard to know how valuable something may be. In the book of James, what we just read, God rebukes Christians who seemingly can't read the price tags. They've lost the understanding of how valuable things should be. But how does God know that they have misread the price tags? Well, what did we read in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 4? James wrote, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war... Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You see, when Christians get into quarrels and fights, there's something going wrong here. And God tells us that this is what is wrong. Verses 3 and 4, we read it. It says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. In other words, when Christians fight and quarrel, it shows that they have put a higher value on the world than the value that they put on God. In fact, Christians who fight and quarrel are called adulterous because they have apparently abandoned their commitment to God. They're no longer committed to God. They're committed to the world. So what's going on here? Well, the root of the problem James is talking about here is that some Christians have fallen in love with worldly possessions. And that is an issue for many Christians the lure of possessions and the promise of happiness is everywhere. People build their lives around how much money they have in a 401k and how many possessions they have in their homes and in their garages. A few years back, I had a very distant relative, actually an in-law relative, who owned a business. He was always struggling financially. I noticed he always leased a brand new car every couple of years, and I suggested that maybe he should downsize. He was shocked, and he replied, but God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? His problem was that he was hooked on the idea that happiness was found in what he possessed. There's an old general store somewhere out in the middle of the Midwest. Travelers stop in, they see a sign that says, if you can't find it in this store, just ask about the item and we'll tell you how to get along without it. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh at that and it is kind of humorous, but notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Right. You cannot serve God and mammon. Man. This is a repeated theme throughout the scriptures. Only a fool clings to the things of the world. One writer explained it this way. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and they weren't even hungry. Mm -hmm. As a result, they ended up losing all that they had in exchange for what? Shame, suffering, and death. Well, that's not the only one. Lot's wife. She fled from Sodom as God destroyed it. But when she looked back at the home that she could not keep, 
She became a pillar of salt. Achan stole a garment of gold from Jericho that he could never wear. And silver and gold that he would never be able to spend. And ended up losing all that he had. Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, which he had no occasion or conscience to use, took his own life in shame and despair. Demas, a companion of Paul, loved this world more than Jesus, walked away from Christ, and brought upon himself the wrath of God. What was it that Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26? I know you've heard it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You've heard that? Yeah. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, trying to gain the world at the expense of walking with God is dangerous. But I believe there's a way to avoid that kind of danger. We don't have to go down that trap. The key to avoiding this danger is found in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. You may know it as soon as we begin to read it. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be yes. saved. Hallelujah. When someone wants to become a Christian, now I will, granted to say in my ministry for the last few years, everyone who I have ministered to are people who are coming back to the Lord. But in the past, when I would witness to people who had never been a Christian, and people would come to me and want to be a Christian, I would sit down and explain a few things to them. And I'll talk about faith and repentance and baptism. But when I talk to them about confessing Jesus as Lord, I pull my wallet out. I explain that Romans chapter 10 is not talking about confessing our sins. No. No. Is talking about confessing Jesus as Lord. Now back in the days of Jesus, if anybody was called Lord, it meant that they owned you. You were the slave, they were the master. And as a slave, you own nothing. By confessing Jesus as Lord, open my wallet here, I'm telling Jesus everything in this wallet belongs to him. Everything in my 401k is his. Amen. My house, my car, my kids, my wife, they all belong to him. Yes. How I spend this money should glorify him and never shame him. How I view my possessions should always reflect the idea that what I think I own really belongs to him. That's right. Amen. So the root of quarreling and fighting that James is talking here is based on the fact that too many Christians fall in love with worldly possessions. And when they cling to these possessions, they ultimately abandon God. But there was something else that caught my attention here. It was the phrase where James 4.1 asked, Where do wars and fights come from among you? James tells us this often happens because we want something we cannot get. Now, sometimes folk argue over possessions. It happens a lot when families are battling over an inheritance because grandma died. But other times those conflicts arise because I want my way. I want something my way, and you won't let me have it. I can't get what I want my way, so I'm going to sit here and I'm going to argue with you. Just before James chapter 4, 1 talks about quarreling and fighting, we read about the fact that earthly wisdom is based on envy and self-seeking, and it brings confusion in every evil thing. We read that in chapter 3, verse 16. And then by contrast, what did James say in verse 17 and 18? We read it. It said, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. 
Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who want peace. Thus every time you or I get upset and we argue and we quarrel with someone, we tend to reflect what type of wisdom? Worldly wisdom. A wisdom that's filled with disorder and vile practices. And what's that mean? It means that many Christians operate under the assumption that if they can insult someone enough or curse at them enough, and this is the most common practice, increase the volume of my voice enough that I can cow the other person into submission and surrender by the force of my anger and indignation. I've done it myself. And I dare say most of you have done it as well. But this is what James means by vile practices. You know, church, we're clearly living at a time in this nation when everything is divisive. The last administration began paving the country for globalism, and the current administration has begun to reverse that direction. And what has that done? It has stirred up a hornet's nest. Yeah. Now the silent majority is no longer silent and people are infuriated. Insults are thrown just by saying Trump. You may try to be saying the word trumpet and before you get the second syllable out, someone's already calling you a name. Now I'm not endorsing anybody from this pulpit. Sure I'm, just, I'm just saying what's going on now. Why is there so much hate and division? Because people are making their judgments on worldly and foolish wisdom. And it's not coming from one side, it's both sides. One of the topics that has been a really sore thumb for us is the topic of climate change. They used to call it global warning. 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 <laughs> I knew I would get it. Well, when all the models just didn't work out and things started cooling off, then they started calling it global cooling. And still their models did not substantiate that claim, so now they're just calling it climate change. Well, they say that man's emissions of carbon dioxide is what's doing it, but yet they have conclusively proven that it's the sun that controls our climate, not the emissions of man. So here they're using foolishness of the world wisdom to make this claim. You see the foolishness of man, or perhaps perhaps it isn't the foolishness. Perhaps they know that that's what it is. And it's downright self-seeking selfishness and greediness that we talked about in James chapter 3. Perhaps that's what it is. If the elite really believed that we the people were responsible for climate change, they would restrict the entire world in emissions. China and India would have to reduce their industry and pollution. But yet the most populated countries in the world has zero restrictions for industry and pollution. What do we conclude from that? Greedy people with currency manipulation agendas. But here's the problem. There are some who are awakened to this reality and there are others who are still snoozing at it. They don't realize what's really going on. And when these topics come up, regardless of what side of the issue that we're on, even the ones who may be right or the ones who may be wrong, we must be careful in our approach and not allow the foolishness to divide us. Now, here's the deal. Many of us have fallen into that trap. We don't agree with someone. We think or we may know that we're right and that they're wrong. And so we argue and we fight. Now a lot of times this happens between us and non-Christians. Well that, that conflict is fairly predictable. Because we tend to tick worldly people off in this world. Why? Because we don't agree with much of what they believe. They get upset with our refusal to accept their point of view of things. And they in turn end up insulting our faith or even our God. And so we get into arguments over things that they reject. Jesus said that was going to happen. What did he say? John 15, 19. He said, if you were of the world, 
the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But why do people get angry at us if we glorify Jesus? Why? Mostly because when we say Jesus saved us, you know what we're saying? That he's the only way to heaven. What did Jesus say in John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That was his words. That's pretty definite. In ancient Rome, this commitment by Christians to Christ led the Romans to hate Christianity. Did you know that the Romans called Christians atheists? Do you know that? Why would they call Christians atheists? Because early Christians refused to worship their God. They made, or I should say that made the Romans very upset. And that hasn't changed for centuries. There are people today who get mad at Christians because there are certain things that we don't accept. Things that are mainstream now, that are all over the news, all over the, the, the tabloids, all over the magazines. Things that the world is accepting, certain choices that people are making that Christians do not accept. And, and people get mad because we're not willing to accept certain things. Why? Well, because they think folks ought to have the right to do and say as they please. But what did we say a few minutes ago? When we gave our life to Jesus, did we surrender everything or did we just surrender part of ourselves? If we surrendered everything, then even our personal choices we surrendered. And so that is why we make our stand and that's why the world hates us. And it makes them mad. Notice what Ephesians chapter 5 declared. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. In verse 11, notice this one. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Notice this. But rather, expose them. Well, that right there tells you why some Christians refuse to not back down. That right there tells you why some Christians choose not to just remain silent and say, just let the world have it. We were told by the apostle here to expose it. So we're always going to be at odds with the world. And we're going to be in conflict with the world because of our love and commitment to Christ. That's part of the deal. When we committed to Christ, it wasn't going to be easy. It was never said it was going to be easy. Like that old country song, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. Right. <laughs> well, Jesus never promised us a rose garden in this life. And so that's part of this commitment we made to him. But regardless, we still have to be careful how we respond to worldly people. We've got to be careful not to get into arguments and quarrels because when we do get into these things, who do we become like? The world. We become like the world. We imitate their style of conflict. You know, there's an old saying that says, you never want to wrestle with a pig. You just get dirty and the pig enjoys it. <laughs> now that's a lighthearted jab at what happens too often too with Christians. We get upset, we say things we shouldn't say, and we even insult people who are non-Christians. But too often, we also do it to people who are also Christians. Christians get mad at each other because they can't get their way about something. They will even insult and threaten and manipulate. And what did God tell us? He said, don't do that. 
Well, ask the question. What's the question? What do, what, what do you do when, when definitely, you know, you're not, you're, whatever you want to do is that you going to go. Even though it's going to be good for you, do you fight for the right to do what is right? Or do you submit? Listen to the remainder of this word. You're going to get your answer. We quarrel and we fight amongst each other because we're imitating the world. That's how the world behaves. But what did we read in James chapter 3, verses 17 through 18? What did we read? The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason. Full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You see, if our behavior towards each other and towards those outside the church is not peaceable, if it's not gentle, if it's not open to reason, we shame our God. Amen. And God will not reward us. We were looked for our way on terms and not his. That's what's happened. And so now God says you don't have because you don't. What's the word again? Ask. 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 Well, we didn't ask God. You see, God will not reward us if we rely on worldly practice of fighting to get our way. The only way you will get what God would give you is to ask Him and rely on Him for the outcome. If we're guided by God's wisdom rather than the wisdom of this world, then we will accomplish His will. There was a couple named Jason and Paul. Paula was a faithful Christian and she was a member of the church. Jason, too, was a decent man, and he would show up to church about once a month, I suspect, just to please his wife. But he wasn't a Christian and really had no desire to be involved in the church. Well, the pastor made, made it his goal to visit everybody in the church, right, including Jason and Paula. So one night, he made his visit with no intention to talk doctrine or church. He just wanted to get to know these two. That was part of his church. All was going well until one of their relatives showed up. This woman and her husband were hardcore Baptists, and they knew that the pastor visiting was not a Baptist, and they wanted to talk doctrine. They wanted to talk baptism. In fact, they wanted to argue with the pastor. But remember, he didn't come to argue he just wanted to visit with Jason and Paula. And these people kept wanting to drag him into an argument. He did his best to stay out of the mud. But when he went out to get into his car to go home, he felt depressed. This whole argument thing had shattered his night. And he just knew he had failed. The next Sunday, Paula came to church. And so did Jason. The Sunday after that, Paula was there, and so was Jason. Jason showed up to church for several weeks in a row, and the pastor began to think maybe he hadn't felt so badly in his visit with them. Then one day, Jason called and asked to talk to the pastor. So the pastor went out to see Jason. He went to his garage, and he talked about everything under the sun, the weather, the work, so on. After about 20 minutes, the pastor said, Jason, I've enjoyed our little talk here, but I got the impression you wanted to talk to me about something special. What's on your mind? Jason said, I want to get baptized. The pastor said, well, when do you want to do that? Jason said, right now. Well... The pastor said, Jason, the baptistry is kind of cold. I don't have any heater in the, in the pump. You know, there's nothing, any kind of heat in this pool. Uh, he said, I don't care. I want to get baptized now. 
So the pastor took him and took him to the church, filled up the pool, cold water, and baptized him. They talked later about it. I'm sure the pastor was so curious why all of a sudden the change. And Jason explained why he had never made that decision before. Apparently everyone he had ever met wanted to argue about religion. They would try to argue him into Christ, whether it was his relative or a preacher. In fact, one preacher went so far as to shame him into going to church. He said, you got a good enough clothes to go to church, don't you? And Jason said, yes, I do, but not yours. My point is simple. We don't accomplish the will of God by using the wisdom of this world. We can't argue or shame people into faith. We can't argue with these people out here that want to talk politics that are already made up in their mind. We must reflect the wisdom of God to accomplish God's will. Yes. And what is God's wisdom? Let's read it again. James chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. God's wisdom is pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Verse 18, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's what we have been called and commissioned to do, church. So many in the church has changed the price tag. They do it their way. They do it the way that human philosophy and wisdom says you have to do it. You know, it's amazing that some leaders will go and get educated and get degrees in certain things and in that, they're, they're taught how to manipulate mind control and they're taught all these things. And they do. That's right. But the thing is, that's not, that's not God's wisdom. It's human wisdom. And that's why, in many respects, there are many churches out here who have done a discredit to God. That's why we have a, 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 a generation of people who don't even want to step foot into a church. Because they've seen the hypocrisy. They've seen the lying. They've seen the manipulation. They've seen the mind control. They've seen the selfishness and the greediness. That's human wisdom. If we use God's wisdom, we do it His way then the Holy Spirit will have something to work with in drawing people to Christ. Amen. And that's the goal. That's the ambition. It's not drawing people to us. It's drawing people to Him. Because He's the only one that's going to save us. As a pastor, I can't save you. Unlike some of those in Catholicism, I can't even say you're forgiven. He, it's his blood. He's the judge. He's the king. He's the one on the white horse. Not, not, not any pastor on this earth. So let's stick with what God placed the value in the beginning. Let's don't change the price tag. Let's do it God's way. And we're hoping that in doing so, God will use these little imperfect vessels do something great for him. That's what it's all about at this point. What can we do for him? I'm, I'm, I want him to crack the sky right now and just bring an end to all of it. I wish he would. But then as the same part of my heart says I wish he would do that, I think of there's people even in my own family who if he came back right now may not make it. So there's a part I'm Part of me is, come now, Jesus, and the other part is, wait. wait. But 
but we have to use his wisdom. His wisdom to appeal to their hearts. And not be judgmental. All this divisiveness that's going on in this country now over politics. Jesus still died for everybody. He died for Obama. He died for Trump. He died for all of us. Let's stop putting labels on people. And show the same love he has. Yes, we may have our own opinion. But let's show the love of Christ in everything we do. Our Father in heaven, I pray that this message certainly touch our hearts. I pray that you allow us to have your wisdom in how we deal with conflicts, how we deal with our human relationships, how we deal, Father, with with everything that's surrounding us. Help us to use your wisdom. Help us to put you first. Help us, Father, even in areas that we know are sinful, in areas that we know are wrong, help us not to be judgmental of others, but rather help us to show love. Help us to have peace. And may the love and the peace and all of the affections and passions that we have toward people in their lives, may that be what moves them to let go of the things they need to let go of. Father, I pray that you forgive us if we have ever displayed any self-righteousness and if we have ever stumbled anybody from being close to you. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us, Father. Take away the self-righteousness. Take away the judgments. Take away the, the spirit of division from us, Father. And help us have the same love that Jesus had. When he hung on that cross and he looked down on those souls, the ones who had, who had crucified him, and he, he begged you at that moment, Father, forgive them, for they know, know not what they do. Father, right now there's people that we work with. There's people we live with. There's people that uh, we go to school with. There's people, Father, that are around us. They do not know what they're doing. They think they do because they're only relying on human wisdom. But may we be a beacon to them by our life, by our conduct, and by our love. And Father, may you use us to draw in more sheep before your judgment day comes. Thank you, Father. Thank you for giving us this knowledge. We just pray, Father, that we will use your wisdom in dispensing it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.